In this screencast, we're going to talk about the typical anatomy of the skeletal system and two main parts to this. One, a typical anatomy of, of a long bone, for example, in the human body and the different parts that most long bones have, and microscopic anatomy of bone tissue. We'll also talk about the main functions of the skeletal system. Um, but first of all, here's the four main parts. Four main parts of the skeletal system, we're going to focus on uh, bone anatomy, but also um, talking about some joints. The cartilages, we won't name any of those by name or go into any detail on cartilages or ligaments, but down the road someday, someday you will. We do need to differentiate between the axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton, and I'm going to let you research to find the difference between those two. As far as the functions of bones, and the skeletal system. You can take a look at um, all of these. The first couple are obvious. Ones that I want to talk about are one, um, storing minerals and fats in, in the actual bone tissue and the cavities within the bone. The, the bones themselves kind of act like a bank where when you need specific minerals you go get a withdrawal from the bank. You can actually, it's kind of a crude way to say it, but you can, you can almost liquefy the bone tissue and increase calcium, um, the calcium ions in the blood and take them wherever they may be needed in the body. For instance, calcium ions are needed for muscle contraction. When you have sort of an excess, you can store and build more bone tissue. So it kind of acts like a bank for the storage of minerals and fats. Um, and also is the hematopoiesis, the actual blood cell formation which takes place in the red bone marrow of the bones of the skeletal system. In bone tissue, there's basically two different types, um, either compact bone or spongy bone. And taking a look, at taking a look at the pictures here, you can easily tell the difference, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory why spongy bone is called spongy and compact bone is called compact. So the next few slides are going to be a combination of, of terms, kind of definitions or description of those, and pictures. So I'm not going to read everything word for word. Um, as far as I know it, I'm going to do, share the, the pronunciation of the way that I learned it and just note like so many things in, in science, uh, depending on where the sources are. You might hear them differently down the road, but you'll want to be feel free to pause during the screencast when you're listening to this and playing it back and, and get some of the written information and um, get the pertinent information from it and ask any questions of me in class that you need. So the first couple of things to get straight, the anatomy of a typical long bone, and we'll see a picture of it again in a second if you haven't already looked through the textbook, um, but two main parts are the diaphysis, Diaphysis and the epiphysis. Um, each, each long bone has a shaft portion and then the ends of it. And the ends of it, since both, since most long bones are going to, all long bones are going to have two ends, you can have what's typically referred to as a proximal epiphysis and a distal epiphysis. And together, if you're referring to them as, as plural, it's epiphyses. So here we are with a typical long bone, uh, same drawing that you're going to find in your book, and again, you're going to see this a number of times, uh, but so far, we've talked about proximal and distal epiphysis, as well as the diaphysis. Periosteum, the outside covering, the connective tissue covering, um, this stuff is really strong stuff. This is actually continuous with the tendons and ligaments of the body. It's real strong stuff. Perforating fibers, also known as Sharpie's fibers, and then of course you'll be able to pick out the arteries which supply the bones with the nutrients, the vital nutrients that they need. And I should say now that bone tissue is far from dead tissue. Um, it's often common myth that bones are just basically a pole or a block inside that the muscles pull on and the skin hangs on but they are very dynamic and very alive as far as tissue. So here's a look at the 
anatomical features we just discussed. The articular cartilage, the name gives it away, articulations or movements of the human body at different joints, and made of hyaline cartilage, remember that it's a very, well, hyaline means glass, glassy, and so there's, there's not very much friction there. There's supposed to be a smooth surface for the bones to move against one another at a joint. You can see the covering being the hyaline cartilage or the articular cartilage at the ends of long bones. As the name implies here, you would find these structures toward the ends of long bones. The epiphyseal plate and the epiphyseal line for our purposes are essentially the same thing. Um, another name for the epiphyseal plate would be the growth plate, which we'll talk more about later when we talk about bone formation and, and growing of the skeleton. The epiphyseal line would be seen in adults or mature skeletons. It's just a remnant of where this growth plate used to be. For us, we can, we can interchange those. It's fine. Again, a typical long bone with some of the anatomical features we've discussed. The marrow cavities. Um, there's two types of marrow in the, uh, in the skeletal system. The yellow marrow, which is mostly fat tissue, adipose tissue, um, in the shafts of the long bone. Um, those shafts or those cavities are called the medullary cavity. That's where you'd find the, the fat or the yellow marrow tissue. The ends of the long bones, in the epiphyses of most long bones, you're going to find red marrow, the site of red, blo uh, red blood cell formations. Um, and most of the skeleton, most of the cavities inside of the bone in children and infants, young, young children and infants, is going to be red marrow. Another picture, typical long bone for reviewing, stopping, pausing, reviewing the anatomical features. On to microscopic anatomy of, of bone tissue. Uh, three structures here. An osteon, also called a Haversham system or a Haversian system. Um, this is what we learned in the tissues unit, is kind of that bullseye or, or tree trunk looking system, that round unit of, of bone tissue. You also have the central or Haversian or Haversham canal, and the side or at right, right angles, perpendicular angles are canal or canals that are called perforating canals, or again, Volkmann's canals. So I'm going to use these terms together, usually when talking about them in a resource, just so you get used to seeing, seeing any of these. So again, these round structures, those are the osteons or the ostea, the Volkmann's canals are the perforating canals going at right angles, and most of these, or all of these, are, are, are for transmission of, of um, nerve tissue, but mostly the arteries that supply the bone tissue with what's needed. Other microscopic terms, lacunae would be the actual cavities that the mature bone cells called osteocytes would be found, and then lamellae, these are the circular rings around the central canal that actually make up the osteon itself. This little piece of the pie I cut out from bone tissue, you can see these anatomical features. In this photomicrograph of bone tissue, you can see an osteon, again with the anatomical features that we just talked about. Each of these individual little dark spots would be individual bone cells, mature bone cells called the osteocytes in the lacunae. They would be the cavities that house those bone cells. And the last anatomical structure um, would be a canaliculus or canaliculi would be plural. These are the tiny little canals um, that radiate from the individual cavity that houses the bone cells. So the canaliculi are all of these small little canals that radiate out from the individual osteocytes and the individual lacuna or lacunae, plural.